computer. Okay, uh, welcome to Talking Smart Conversations with Educators and Philosophers from Around the World. I'm your host, Richard Mortmonos. My guest today is Professor Soon Gardner. Dr. Gardner is a professor of uh, philosophy at uh, Cap Capilano. Capilano, that's there you go, um, in North <laughs> Canada. Uh, her publications are primarily in critical thinking and philosophy for children. She is also director of the Vancouver Institute of Philosophy for Children. Uh, Professor Gardner is also the director of the Vancouver Institute for uh, Philosophy for Children and director of the Thinking Playground, um, and is co-director of the North American uh, Community of Inquiry uh, and vice president of ICPIC from 20, 2017 to 2022. Uh, Dr. Gardner has received, and this I didn't know, a bachelor's in nursing. I uh, did, <laughs> a long time ago. Yes, yes, uh, from McGill. Um, and a BA um, from McGill in philosophy as well, and a uh, a, a BPhil uh, in philosophy from Oxford, and an MLit uh, from Oxford, and a PhD in interdisciplinary uh, studies. And, and the interdisciplinary studies are philosophy, sociology, and psychology. I was kind of wondering about that. I, now I understand some of your writing better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and why we have a good deal in common yes uh, in terms of our educational backgrounds anyway and then i list in this will all be uh three uh of your books in uh in that articles in in 2023 and 24 uh and then and then your books so that's and that'll all be in the bio so with that introduction, um, <clears throat> uh, we uh, we sort of agreed to talk about uh, a couple of topics, and uh, let me think. Let's start with um, uh, teaching a sense of collective identity, uh, an urgent educational imperative. Uh, can you give a little overview of that, and then we'll start uh, looking at some of the details and discussing Yes, okay. yes. Well, uh, I wrote I wrote that with Wayne Henry. So, um, well, this is called Smart Talk. So he was hanging out at my place for a while, um, and we do a lot of talking about what we take to be the demise of democracy presently because of uh, what is referred to as woke. And that is this notion of identity politics, where you've got uh, people who identify in smaller and smaller groups. So it might be homosexuality, it might be by uh, race, it might be by gender, it might be by transgender, and so on. And so this identity politics is such that uh, and understandably, because in that particular article, we go over um, why it is the case that we tend to go into tribes. So there are a number of reasons why. I mean, it, it, it's human beings are bad people, and we tr we tribalize not because we're bad. We tribalize for a number of very important reasons. One is that we be, we become self-conscious by dividing the world between good and bad. That's how we, we become aware of ourselves because mom or a caretaker says that's bad and that's good. And so we become aware of our behavior because we're able to divide the world into between good and bad. And then Green and a number of others, social psychologists, have argued that uh, we tri tribalizing is a function of uh, evolution. So we figured out very quickly that if we cooperate with some others into a small group, um, then we could outcompete the other group. So tribalizing is natural for that. 
And it is also natural because of the economy. You know what? If if I get I if I want to sell my widgets and you want to sell your widgets, I'm going to try and you know compete with you. And and of course, also our combined interest here, and that is social media. And that is social media is just doing a terrible number on ensuring that we are that we are solidified in our tribe. And so we, they've got algorithms now. So if you are, let's say, uh, anti-white male, you you can get on to a sites that show how awful white cisgender males are. And then you're absolutely convinced of your position. So Wayne and I, in talking about it, thought, look, we really honestly have to create an education so that young people recognize that we could all have a sense of collective identity together. If we're going to solve the problems of the world, Mort, and we're, and I am, and I'm sure many people are as well, uh, it's not clear to me that humanity can survive climate change. And we've got work to do. <laughs> we've got to stop squabbling like, you know, spoiled toddlers. We have to be able to dialogue across difference. So that is part of the what that article was trying to make the claim. And I think that um, I used to think when I started in with philosophy for children that it was sort of a nice uh, pedagogical format, which I use, by the way, all the time in university. So I always do communities of inquiry. But I now think it it may be the only pedagogical format that will save the human race. We have to learn to dialogue across difference. And it's it it is a it is a wonder if if we can if if we can convince educators to use this format. Young people love it. They love it. I I was doing a university course in um, environmental ethics last term, and there was a young man. Um, well, he was in his thirties, but comparatively speaking, a very young man. And uh, he was sitting at the break, and he was sitting there doing this. And I said, "What's the matter? What's the matter?" He said, "I don't know what's going on in this class." Like when we go out, we talk to each other. We actually talk about what we've been talking about in class. And we talk about whether or not we agree with that. And he said, how, how, how does that happen? <laughs> so, so, so um, and, and that, of course, is the problem with uh, Sage on the stage. We, we, I can understand Sage on the stage, you know, in light of... Uh, Putin and you know all of the other terrors that are going on. We want people who are real smart, and they have to uh, ingest a huge amount of information. But it needs also that students actually talk to each other. So that's what all of that was about. <laughs> that's oh. my shtick. Yeah. Well, I, I have, and I just wrote myself a note now. I don't know if I'll remember what my three questions are, but I have three questions that okay. came, up, came up in this short conversation. Um, and and one of them is um, the understanding of why we become groups is essential. and uh, But what is challenging, and I know you address that in, in, in terms of sort of establishing a platform for democracy but i guess i'm more a more detailed perspective on how we make that move from my gosh we need to do this because we need to cooperate with each other and 
let's just say, say, for example, we university people have this collective that we know how to help each other into, but uh, Joe Schmo down the line or Mary Smith, uh, uh, they don't have that exposure. And how do we make that move so that our in-group work works with this larger group? Uh, ah, the $60 million question. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, you know, there may be... Um... <sighs> Well, certainly when we do the philosophy for children camp. So we have the same magical uh, outcome. And so the, the counselors that devote their whole year to doing the curricula for the philosophy for children camp, their goal, they keep saying one child at a time. I'm going to just do it one child at a time. I think though, if we can just spread the word how you spread the word is is your question mm. um and i think part of the problem is the label philosophy for children so i think it's got to be something like philosophy uh, philosophical inquiry and education for philosophical inquiry the difficulty though more is that um it takes real talent to to run a community of inquiry. Yeah. It looks easy on the outside, which is why it's hard to proselytize this movement. So I remember when Matt was alive and uh, I went out with Phil, Anne's husband, to watch him try and convince schools to take on philosophy for children. And if you, you, you may remember, Matt said, don't tell them what we're doing, <laughs> just do it. And of course they thought that all we were doing was having a class discussion. And so they would say, well, we do that already. <laughs> so um, that's not gonna work. We need to actually articulate, uh, as we actually do to our campers, we go into our campers initially and we talk about the importance of being able to listen to opposing points of view. And we say it over and over and over again, and we say it with drama, that you cannot be a reasonable person if you do not listen to people who disagree with you, because it is the only way to eliminate error on your part. So this is a gift. If you can listen, people are giving you a gift if they disagree with you. Yes. And we emphasize that if you change your mind in the middle of a community of inquiry, we want you to give yourself a big hug because Changing your mind doesn't show you're stupid. It shows you're wise. It shows that you're following reasons wherever they lead. I give the same spiel to my university students. And uh, it, it's quite amazing what can happen. So I also insist, by the way, that um, the topics are relevant which makes it scary for a lot of educators because we live in the age of woke and you're liable to get canceled if you don't do it, you know, if you, if you interfere in some way with somebody's bubble. But I had in my class, this class that I was talking about, I had a lot of young people from India and there were some from the Punjab who are six and some who were Hindu. And they wanted to talk about whether or not the Punjab should be uh, independent. They had the most respectful, interesting discussion um, about whether or not, they actually came to the idea that it wasn't a good idea. <laughs> 
Even mm. the six decided that wasn't a good idea because there are a number of other uh, communities in India, which would mean India would break up, I think it was 56 communities or something. And so they decided, well, if the Punjab went, so would everybody else go. So I think if we keep writing, if we keep talking, if we keep doing what you're doing and having smart discussions and uh, trying to reach as many people as we can, uh, uh, that's the best I can think of, unless anybody can think, can you think of something better? Yes, well, no, and 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 again, maybe this, but I, <clears throat> talking smart, um, the reason I picked that title is because what I, it's sort of modeled on that idea of coming out of the classroom and continuing the discussion. Or just when you put on a pot of coffee in your office and somebody drops in and somebody else drops in and all of a sudden we're beyond university politics and we're talking about real stuff. And 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 I guess maybe I think maybe Lida and I from that's what well what, that was part of our growing up together. Um, we did Sunday breakfasts. Um, and just the two of us, and we'd have breakfast, and we'd talk smart. And we started yeah. doing that about the time she was in the end of middle school, beginning of high school. And 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 that, you know, I mean, it's, that's such a fantastic idea, this overflow, the way conversation overflows from serious discussions to casual discussions back to serious discussions and that whole integrated process. And so, <clears throat> yeah, may, maybe, and I hadn't, thought about this in that in those kind of grandiose terms. But again, this is what I think we're trying to do with this, you know, because it's all different people. I mean, I think we've uh I we've gone beyond philosophy of children, although probably I I don't know, maybe half of the 30 people or so are philosophy of children. And then they're just other folks who are doing interesting mm -hmm. stuff. And yeah. So anyway, I, I didn't I didn't want to push that too much but that and 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 I think that bridge piece though is really interesting I still I I and I I guess what I keep struggling with is that turning point where we we, we realize that there's some switch that happens from in group to total group I mean to to out group and everybody else and and that kind of magic little place is is hard to even define, much less to get to. Uh, and so, and I'll say one more thing, and maybe I'm already transitioning to something. But Cheryl Turk, uh, Sherry Turkle, has some wonderful stuff, uh, and maybe most well developed in her um, sort of intellectual biography, which is, I think is her most recent book. Um, and talking about that whole, uh, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to say more than I want to say, but let me get this out. Part of the thing that I find fascinating about Turco is that her first book, uh, you know, was on, uh, the Lacanian revolution in, in France. Um, and she was, as a undergraduate, she was sort of thrown into the 68 Paris um, and that was and then she went back and did a year in Paris as, as part of her graduate degree at, at Harvard and sort of reflected and did more interviews about the whole Lacanian movement and 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 I think interestingly she's carried that through all of her work in some interesting ways both as a as an ethnographer and as a person who was also thrown into another quite different culture, that being uh, MIT as a abstract, robotic, <laughs> uh, almost uh, institution, you know? Uh, and for her, her first husband, although he was in education, was a big buddy of Minsky and all of that whole group. And so all of that stuff got very interestingly integrated in, in her work. And now I don't know where I'm going with that. 
<laughs> okay, but you were saying that, and so maybe you can pick this up. So one of the things you were saying was, where is the turning point? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think there is a turning point. I think it's a constant battle. Yeah, yeah. I had a, a student uh, who was an anti-vaxxer. Very, very, very smart student. And he was so smart, I couldn't really quite understand how he could be an anti-vaxxer. And it took both of us um, a lot of reflection and energy to ensure that uh, we could maintain a close relationship despite the fact that he was an anti-vaxxer and it went all the way to you know for him saying well I so this is sort of turkle too so I um well I read a different website than you do yeah yes and so I said but you know I'm not young and so if you don't get vaccinated and you're out and you come here and I get sick that could be the that could be the end of me don't you think you should take that into account? No, he was at, no, I was reading the wrong website. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so uh, I think that we have to accept that, um, it, that there are some people, uh, maybe all of us have some identities uh, that are such that they're non-negotiable. And so part of my reflection was, okay, I can, uh, I can live with that. I, we just will, and we did, we negotiated so that until the, the pandemic was over, we were never in the same room. Mm. And the pandemic is over and not, not a problem. So I think that it, there may be the case that, that it, no matter how smart you are, no matter how much both of you want to listen to opposing points of view, um, it may not be possible. And I think this is particularly true with uh, social media. Yes. yes. That, that people really have, and, and of course the algorithm ensures that you only see the, <laughs> you, you can get to 10, 20, 30, websites that will tell you that you know that climate change is 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 a hoax and it was started by the chinese yeah. you know that trump said that <laughs> yep, yep. so um and and so it's it's we've got to bring youngsters up as well to recognize that uh i mean i come from a family of scientists you know my my daughter's um assistant chief veterinarian for the province of British Columbia. So she knows all about viruses. My son-in-law is a doctor. So, uh, but it wasn't to be had. His website was more convincing. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. now again, I, I'm really good. I was following you so intently that I, and I, I should write notes all the time so I can remember what I want to ask, but Oh, I was just I was just thinking about um the whole idea about um to what extent we have to sort of say, okay, this is non-negotiable and uh we have to agree to disagree. Um, but that's a very challenging place to be uh, and to maintain. I think that's the uh, and to 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 not that not let that let let that um uh interfere with a wider conversation that's because right the problem with that idea of saying well we'll just keep this separate then i start thinking oh what else should i keep separate what where do i draw, draw the line and can i raise this question now because he doesn't I'll use an example with somebody I know. He doesn't like Trump. So how can I talk to him about some other things that might be controversial? Um, and, and and I don't know. I mean, 
but that's a that's a real challenge, and I think some ways part of the solution is if you there's often room to talk to talk about things as issues as long as it's not in terms of specific politics. If you say, "Oh, let's look for a solution to this problem," you 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 can often get into those new areas where you really disagree, but you can talk it through. Yes, I think that's right. When you say you've got to keep looking forward, we can't look back. You can't change the past. There are all kinds of descriptions and redescriptions of the past. Um, so uh, there was another article that, which I think you read because it was the one we sent to you that I wrote uh, with Daniel Anderson, and that is that. Um, there's a book that shows that most of the disease, most of the people who died on contact were because of disease. And yet uh, many people want to believe it was because the um, religious educators were murderers and torturers. Mm -hmm. But the evidence doesn't support that. Okay, The evidence does not support that. There are a number of bodies that have been found in uh, near residential schools in Canada. Uh, but there were a number of, I've forgotten the percentage, but I mean, a huge number of all young people died during that time, both in Europe and in, you know, the conquered countries uh, from disease. So, but, but then people don't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's okay, sort of. I think that uh, as long as that, if that helps them heal, and if it doesn't interfere with um, cooperative enterprises going forward, I think that's okay. I'm not sure. Well, you know, I think it's interesting because our own local Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration, um, and who are, well, I mean, among other things, you know, Francis, St. Francis is their sort of hero, um, and yet they were involved with uh, Indigenous, um, pulling Indigenous people out of their tribal areas and then putting them in schools and doing all of that stuff and that was sort of against what they talked about and really believed to a certain extent to it but but and 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 uh, so I, part of the, our problem uh, the ones that weren't involved in this directly is how to listen carefully to that without being judgmental about saying it oh wasn't i so much better than you even though I never had a chance to even experience that, but right. I'll, I'll take credit that's right. for it anyway. You know? That's right. That's right. That's right. I think that's so right. And I think also, but I think you just put your finger on the, on the problem. And that is the need to believe that you are better than others. Because look, if you take a look at, um, what I just the, actually the paper I did for Rome um, uh, and it was talking about indigenous the value of indigenous perception but it but that aside um when if you take a look at what the how the Europeans were living in the say the 16th century and what they came what they saw here um yeah, they thought, well, we were we're better than they are. We've got a better culture. They had significantly more wealthy uh, standard of living. And so they thought, okay, well, we should educate these kids. <laughs> so now look, if they hadn't, if they'd come over and said, well, we're not going to educate them, they would have been, we now would be saying, how awful is that? <laughs> so it didn't matter what they did. We are going to find fault with what they did. So I think you you've you've hit the nail on the head. You've got to say, look, 
people may or may not have done their best in various situations in the past. We need now to get together and make the world a better place. How do we go forward right, right. doing that? Yes, yes. And uh, and that is uh, that is a big question. And 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 you know and, and again that other complexity complexity involved in this is well I, we used to have a saying when we had we did summer camps for uh, low income students and they spent three weeks at the Terrible and we just did what we did. Um, but anyway, we had a saying that uh, arose spontaneously, and that is not forgive and forget, but forgive and remember. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a really interesting way that got us through. Well, actually, I ended up not being involved in that for after a couple of years, but that pro project went on for 15 years and involved into all kinds of things. And I think partly based on that, Forgive and remember, because we can't forget. But no. we screwed up, you know. Yeah. As well as the problems that they caused, they are both there together. And the, and if we forget them, then we don't have the grounds to move forward either. That's right. And, and, That's right. and, and we like to think, oh, well, let's just forget about it and move forward. No, uh, let's let's do both. And and I think that's a that's a real challenge. And and. And again, I think that works back to your conversation with your uh, with your anti-vaxxer, because in in you know you forgive, but let's also remember that somehow that's at the core of where our disagreement is about, and that maybe can sit fallow for a while, but it's still something that needs to be remembered and possibly worked on in some time in the future. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah, but I think you're right about uh, remember because part of reasoning together requires a sense of fallibility yes and not just fallibility from, from the other guy <laughs> you know the other guy made mistakes yes. and that's part of what it is to have a sense of collective identity and that is you know what we human beings screw up quite a lot <laughs> yeah. and i'm a human being yeah. So there's a very good chance that I'm going to be about to screw up. Yes, yes. And you and one of the things that I also we stress to our youngsters, and that is you will screw up no matter how you reason. You, you never I mean, the optimal is that you're able to access an infinite number of points of view. That's not possible. So. It's going to always be less than perfect. And you have to give yourself a hug. As long as you've reasoned it through as best you can and you try desperately to listen to those people who disagreed with you. And including, and importantly for you people in America, now uh, the people who want to vote for Trump. You know that are just being uh well you're you're an idiot what's the matter with you how could you possibly well there's there's somehow or other he has spoken to a number of fellow americans let's try and hear what they hear yeah and, and that's yes now and i think this relates to a topic which we've haven't maybe touched on accidentally and but uh i've been um uh, made aware of that one of the uh, real issues of education is imagination um and and it is a uh entity that is seen in full flower in young people uh they have I and mean, a part of what it means to think about the future is to imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and if we don't encourage that imagination, um, and I think like you do in your summer camps, I think that's kind of at the core, uh, as I understand it anyway. And this is mostly from Arthur, by the way, because uh, I did an interview with him and I've, I learned an awful lot uh, about your program from Arthur, which was a 
a nice, a very nice thing to do. But anyway, I really, I think, and, and maybe you want to say something more about imagination and the role of that in the whole idea of dialogue too, because mm -hmm. part of dialogue is considering alternatives. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and an alternative is an imaginary future in some way. Mm -hmm. so. It needs, though, to be an imagination which is constrained by relevant, um, reasonable dialogue, because otherwise your imagination can, oh, well, you know, you're the next Hitler yeah. or you're the next whatever. And uh, and so and kids are more inclined to go there, the monsters, they're monsters. And so, in fact, I think it is. Um, I don't I, I think uh, breathing life into their imagination is easy, but I think ensuring that they keep it so that it belongs to them and they're willing to own it uh, is going to requ is requires then this enormous power of reasoning again so uh, is this is this a reasonable picture of the other person am i being really fair are they because if you if you get them to start drawing people that disagree with them they've got horns they've got stuff coming out of their noses so so they're uh, it, because more it's so hard when somebody disagrees with you yes it, yeah. they, and and particularly when they're young because then they're worried because they've been in this environment and you can see them when they first start they're looking at you like oh he disagrees with me and then does that mean I'm stupid? So no, it really, it's it's all about, um, but we did use, we had a wonderful uh, exercise, this last camp in imagination. And we had it about um, people who don't listen mm -hmm. and they had to do skits. So Arthur and I, you were talking about Arthur, we did the, this little book called Meet the Ignos. Now, igno in that little book is not somebody who is ignorant of facts. They're ignorant in the sense that they do not listen to others. And there are a number of reasons why people don't. So it might be that uh, they have such a big ego so that they don't listen because they they have a big ego. It might be because they're tribe. It might be because it's going to cost them money and so on and so forth. So we got a number of these little ego, uh, um, ignos. And so we had them do skits on this. Now we'd never done that before. And I was a bit nervous about that. They loved it. And boy, could they ever get into it? No, 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 I'm not listening to you. I'm not listening to you. <laughs> so <they're... laughs> and so we, what we were trying to do was to show to them that um this is happening in their own in their own environment and so that when they hear that and so then they have to do the skit okay what are you what are you going to do with mary when she says no 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 i'm not going to listen to you and so they have to figure out together okay what are they going to do with mary and why does mary do that and and um we had one igno is called igno no and that was because I don't care. He yeah. doesn't listen because he doesn't care. Mm -hmm. And so then they had to figure out, oh, yeah, we know lots of people like that. So it, so it translates into their own environment. But you're absolutely right. They loved doing the skits. So they loved being able, and they had to, they, they made their own people and their names and they got really mad at each other. <laughs> yeah. Well, now this is probably maybe considered way off topic, but it's an area, and and the, I, I guess this is only partially a question, but I'll premise this by, by saying, that one of the real values or one of the real alternatives 
to the internet clicking and rewarding and taking you down narrow paths is a good library or a good bookstore. Um, and because you cannot, I think if you have a good bookstore, you cannot go down the aisle and not be attracted by something that's not in your area and not in your interest <laughs> at the that's time exactly. until you see it. You know, <laughs> and that's why we end up with those shelves like behind you. Yeah. Because I, right. would never, <laughs> I would never intend to read that book. I know. <laughs> but my God, look at it. Uh, and, but here's the thing, though. So there's a there's a lovely book. I've forgotten the name of the author. It's called Reader Come Home. <laughs> and uh, reading is going down the tubes as well. Yes, yes. And uh, and so they've done studies, for example, that even uh, if you read, if you read a book with paper, and you probably have this. I mean, I know I could take out Kant's critique of pure reason, and I know where the transcendental deduction is. Yeah. Um, but if you read it on a screen, same whatever book, same book. You don't retain it in the same way that you do when you have placeholders. You know that this was at the beginning of the book. This was at the end of the book. This was, and um, that's going to be a problem. That uh, one of the the studies they've done with regard to reading is that it creates. Uh, a different layer because while you're reading let's say you were reading fiction you have to keep the storyline in your head as you're as you're you you see more characters come into the story and that creates this more complex way of looking at the world apparently this doesn't happen even if you read a book on screen but even kids aren't reading books on screens, they are playing on, you know, they're playing games on their iPads and so on. Yeah. Well, even if I have articles, this is what I do it all. <laughs> I, don't, I don't read them on screen. Yes. I can't, I can't because I, I need to keep that in front of me. I need to make marginal notes. Um, yes, and, right. and, and I don't. And this is maybe, well, one of the things that I have believed for almost as long as I've been doing university teaching, uh, is that one of our primary jobs of being a university teacher is to teach reading. And, and it's not decoding because they're pretty good at that. Uh, but it's, it's how to act. And I owe that all going all the way back to Mortimer Adler and uh, Van Duren in mean, a sixty sixty four thousand dollar question, you know, I know he he wrote that with he was the guy that caught up in the in the sixty four thousand dollar question scandal. If you if you remember back to that those days, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, oh well, there was the, there was that. I'll, I'll just do a, two seconds on this, but there was a program which was called the sixty four thousand dollar question, which was a lot of money back in the late nineteen fifties, um, and they got. They, they started out easy and then they put them in isolation booths and they had to answer these more and more complex questions. And this guy by the name of Van Duren got caught up in the, and it turned out he had given, been given some of the answers or at least the questions ahead of time. But anyway, he wrote a new edition of How to Read a Book with, with Matt, uh, Mortimer Adler. And it, it's, a, it's an amazing book. It was one of the books that taught me how to be a student. Oh. Um, you no, know, and and it's uh, was first written in 1950s something 54, whatever, and it just here's how you read philosophy, here's how you read history, here's how, you, and 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 the one of the overarching pieces is uh, you can disagree with authors, but not until you understand them. Yes, <laughs> and that yes. goes back to your listening stuff. Yes. Yes. It, because the core of listening or reading is understanding. That's that's what we're going for. So that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. <laughs> but I guess for sure. And so if you if you that's why if you if somebody says something you disagree with, the first thing that sh should come out of your mouth is why do you believe that? Mm -hmm. Not I disagree with you. Yes. 
because you can't just you can't n know that you disagree with them until you hear the reasons why yeah. so yeah for sure yeah, yeah. So. and when we ask ourselves those own questions we're forced to articulate and that's why people have no idea this just makes me insane why would i want to have a computer write something for me because once that happens I no longer understand what I'm thinking. I cannot understand. I, you know, I mean, I remember Piaget talking about his writing experience. And he says, I don't understand what I believe until I write it. That's right. Yes. Uh, and I, yeah. So that is. Uh, so, yeah. Well, so we're going to we're going to get more and more depressed as we continue <laughs> to talk. But but yeah. uh, chat GBT. Uh, has made university education a real challenge. And you can understand, I can understand why students use it. It is the tragedy of the commons. Uh, their pals are using it and getting A's. If they are, uh, particularly uh, if they're kids that English as a second language. So we have lots of those at our university. We've got a particular number from India, as I said. And their pals are getting straight A's, then they're stupid if they don't use chat GPT. So they do. But the <laughs> the difficulty is their English isn't good enough to recognize that they couldn't possibly have written this. <laughs> so <laughs> it comes like we, although we have machines and so on that are supposed to detect it. But um, I have I, I have simplified my, uh, I, they don't write a long essay for me. They write that you have to do a thesis statement, a support, an opposition, a response, and a conclusion. But they have to write, before they can do all of that, they have to write three arguments for, or three reasons for, and three reasons against. For me to read and mark, so it's harder to get chat GPT to do all of that sort of stuff. I get, I, I think I know what you're talking about, but I've never used it. And so give me two minutes about that chat thing. Oh no, they, I tell you, you can put on anything. Um, please, uh, I need a, a paper on- oh, Okay, for, yes, yes, I know, yeah. Why, I need a paper on why uh, casual sex is okay. And it needs to be uh, five paragraphs long with two or three quotes. And it'll write the whole thing literally as you, before, you, like less than a minute, the whole thing. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so, you know, and so now, and some now have gotten a little more sophisticated and what they do is they get it chat gpt to write it and then they rewrite it so they're all so that now they're using their brains in order not to learn yes 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 so it's it's quite discouraging yeah, yeah. It's, i i you know i've luckily escaped all of that in terms of teaching so i don't have yeah. to worry about that thank goodness but but and you know i know people have talked about that and, I, and I, but i the names don't even stick in my head. So, but anyway, um, well, we have, obviously we have our work cut out for us, I guess is the bottom line of this discussion. And, and the environment, I mean, I, I think this is helpful to think about this way. And you, I'd like to hear your perspective on this. Well, it is probably the key issue for survival of the human species uh, the flourishing of the human spirit species depends on a lot more uh, you know that's the first step but i i my hope i continue to hope that our end goal is to flourish and uh and i i don't I, well i don't respond <laughs> <laughs> Talk among yourselves. <laughs> I think that's right. And I think we will. Um, I think what we do have on our side is that um, 
and, and as Turkle's um, work has shown, and that is youngsters are becoming more depressed and more lonely and more anxious and so on. And as they feel that they need to uh, create an image of themselves, they need to advertise who they are, they need to be true to their own brand and all of that sort of stuff. And it's, it's, uh, it, it is something that seems to be incompatible with human flourishing. So I think it will be the case that I'm hoping that this is a bump and that we will come back to recognizing that we flourish by reasoning together and we can conquer. I mean, we've conquered so much. I mean, the world is is so much better than it's ever been before. And I think if we uh, stay hopeful and focus on the young folks and welcome them into reasonable dialogue, I think when they, it's like a breath of fresh air to them. <laughs> and so all of us who, who are working with youngsters where they actually get to reason together and flourish, uh, I think it it creates an image for them. So I think that those folks that are in philosophy for children or let's say who are in uh, educational philosophical inquiry um, are the heroes. They're going to be the heroes. Get us through this. Well, maybe on that very, very positive note, uh, that's a good place to end. So I will push the stop button and then let the machine do the work. 